yeah, it's um, it's difficult. I don't know. If, um, Takashi, you and I have talked about this. I was fired from a Green Dot school, which is a charter school, a charter high school in Los Angeles. And um, it was very apparent from, from the beginning for me, like I knew that this was going to happen at some point. There's no way that one could properly teach and under these like conditions. Um, but when you do do that thing that we've been talking about all day and you align yourself with youth and you fight for their voice, um, you are an automatic target. Um, and so I think as I get older in this, in this enterprise, I'm better able to figure out how to not fail. And it's an interesting line you have to step within the curriculum and how you do it. Because it's, I, I've realized recently that if you just tweak it a different kind of way, then people can't see it. But they don't think that nothing's happening. And then I never knew that that existed. Um, and it's just a cool, inter, I don't know, it's a, it's a thought experiment that I've been, I've been dealing with. Like, how can you tweak it so that people don't get offended, um, that people feel comfortable. Yeah, Nathaniel. Can you give an example of that? Because I'd like to hear more on that, actually. So, like, one thing that people didn't like was this, there was a mock trial that I did, and I used um, an actual document that was used at Georgetown and at Harvard Law Schools, but it was, it was a rape case. Mm -hmm. um, the graphic was there, but it was a rape case and I got permission in terms of like parents. But that was not looked at well because there is another curriculum that was supposed to be going on for this reading class. Um, but then I was able to do the same thing um, in this other setting, similar circumstances in terms of student background. And um, I guess tweaked it in such a way where it was a little less intense and not as graphic in terms of the language and people were automatically okay with it. Like the concepts and the ideas they didn't have a problem with, nor the, the way in which I was laying it out. But I mean, it, there could have been a whole, you know, number of other variables that accounted for that difference, of course, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to chase that, that in the pedagogy these days, like, how can you make this? Yeah and like and authentic and like it, it actually works yeah i'm in search of words. i mean i've always like just seen with my own experience like in my charter school like i, I create my own curriculum from the ground up the principal yeah. gets the final okay but i just realized that kind of like you you cannot underestimate your students in terms of like what they can handle and what they can take. And once they realize that, the more likely they are to utilize the skills that you're actually trying to teach. It just so happens though that for me, I always just try to push things to the limit. I don't know why, maybe it's a problem, but like that's something. <laughs> and it's weird, like when I think about that as an Asian American teacher too, like digging into the real griminess of like, uh, cause what did I do? I actually did a whole unit on, I, as, social, as a social studies teacher, I teach ancient civilization, but what I do is I connect it to contemporary issues. So we just finished Egypt going over social class, mm. but then I decided to like, go in a completely different direction and the rest of my unit was actually on the prison industry and so I should have gotten permission to show uh, students uh, like a good chunk of 13 13th and like uh, all these other articles but um, I, I don't know I'm just one of those type of people who says like do it first, apologize later type of thing. So it's interesting that you talk about those nuances because that could potentially save me. Is your charter school unionized? No. Yeah, that, that was the first thing I was thinking was like, oh, if you're not unionized, like as soon as I got tenure, I was like, mm -hmm. all right, we're doing right. whatever the hell exactly. we want. <laughs> exactly. like, right. there's, a, the there's a small shield that is put yeah. over you. Has not to. Yep, <laughs> yeah. So I got more progressive. The content got more intense. Like, oh, we're going right. to talk about right. this. And if That's people right. want to complain, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. true. Very true. I was curious. Uh, this is more for Aldrich and Nathaniel. Are, 
has there been an increase of charter schools in the city where you teach? Yes, very, yes. very much. Um, Bay Area charters are starting to come in to Stockton, you know. Um, um, Aspire charter schools, I don't know if, if you all are yeah. familiar with Aspire. They're pretty big. They started out in Stockton, yeah. It's going to Stockton, Oakland, LA. Um, yes, there's definitely a very, very big push um, for charter schools. So it's where, it's where I started off um, my career. I think a lot of us, because for some of us, sure. when we got hired, that's what was available at that time. But yeah, yeah it's, it's a big deal, this privatization that's happening and taking place. So yeah, Whew, that's a big, big topic right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. In, in Oakland, in our area, we have a, a charter presence. There's actually, I went up to the, the administrative building right before the coronavirus hit, and it's the eighth floor, which is above the OUSD, whatever it is. And if you walk through there, it's just an entire floor. And the sign says, Oakland Unified School District's D uh, Department of Charter Schools. The, every, all of these desks don't have anybody working in them, but every, all the equipment is brand new. There's like a printer, um, things are ready to go. And um, I saw this a little while back. And I think in terms of the moves that are being done online, the, the tech folk, um, there's, there's a big jump towards privatization. And I imagine a lot of charter companies will come online and be like, we have these gadgets and gizmos and, you know, people will be swayed that way and so on and so forth. I, I think after this whole situation, these charter school folks are going to come hard. Like, hey, we can do distance learning easy. We got it set up. I'm, right. I'm really expecting all these tech companies to come out and really market a lot of things. Um, yeah. I also share that concern very much. And, you know, it's also just, on the one hand, I guess change isn't necessarily a bad thing, but when I think about how the charter schools like just fuck up the dynamic of like neighborhood schools, right? like that makes my blood boil in particular. Because like it or not, like when students find out that I live in the neighborhood, like right by the school, thank God they haven't found out my address. Like they buy in to my class a lot more because right, they right. know that I experience what they experience. I'm not like busing or driving from, you know, the bougie north side coming down to the south side. No, I live here. It's my home too type of thing. Now that's obviously one thing, but uh, it's not looking too good out here too. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say, uh, is, how are the budget cuts? Because I know there's a lot of discussion about that right now. Is it the same in Chicago, I'm assuming? Yeah, there have been a lot of budget cuts, but you know, that, that's, I feel like that's just a really, it's a really weird issue that is rooting itself both into the charter schools and the public school system because, <sighs> CPS has enough drama as it is right now. And, you know, the mayor, Betsy DeBoss, and all those hard hitters aren't making it any easier. So it's definitely an issue. Yeah. LA has got a bunch of charters too. Um, I imagine kind of like what you mentioned, Eldridge, um, there'll probably be more popping up after this um, pandemic. I always find it interesting that charter schools tend to only target really low income schools. You will never see that in like the white suburbs, you know, uh, at least like the public charter schools, like a big, like, uh, go ahead, Nathaniel. You know, I think it's interesting because I've also noticed on the north side of Chicago, which is predominantly white and upper middle class. I mean, on the one hand, there are some really great public schools up there, but it's interesting that a lot of the kids go to charter schools as well, whereas the immigrant families and, you know, the Black and Latinx families will mainly be, quote unquote, stuck with charter. Not to disagree, I do think that race plays an issue into the charter school system, but you know, amidst all the bureaucracy and the red tape, it hides itself really well. 
But are those schools uh, located in like the urban areas? Like those white students are coming, um, like just busing it to the schools in the inner city or? I mean, to clarify once again, I don't think I consider the north side inner city to be fair, but you know, there are definitely a lot of magnet schools, um, which out here, it's basically the same function in, uh, you know, downtown. There are some on the south side, but uh, it's interesting because Chicago's south side like has this huge pocket of black communities, which is surrounded by an even bigger pocket of white communities. And so charter schools in that sense, there is like, uh, there are students, white students, rich white students who will come to the South side, but it's not in the pocket of the black communities. They will cross that pocket and go to a charter school that is even further South. Mm, I see. Yeah, I also think that if um, sort of a, a historical look at it is charters have existed for a long while and mm -hmm. there are charters like in South Orange County where they are sort of populating this area where they're dissatisfied with the arts programs at the public institutions. So then you get arts program charters in the same way that you get like continuation charters, right? But, you know, people want to hit the, the big schools and they want to say like, okay, we can do what they do, uh, but we want to compete with them. And that market for the, whatever the culture right now is, you know, poor kids, which happens to be, you know, black and brown kids. And so that market is, is so prime. It's like prime real estate. And I think it kind of goes back to something, Nathaniel, you were saying, which is this idea of commodification of the youth of color. That, that culture resides in the charter movement, in that neoliberal, right, nonprofit organization, that, that, that vulture that is in that outfit. Um, so it's, it's really, and it's very business culture, right? That's kind of what it's getting right. back on. You know, Daniel, it's very interesting that you mentioned that, especially the history aspect, because interestingly enough, I know that uh, a lot of uh, education experts out here said that in Chicago, particularly, charter schools' main function was a sort of laboratory mm. in that teachers could experiment with their curriculum, see what works, see what doesn't and then bring that to the public school system to try and make it more accessible. But as you pointed out, the whole ne the neoliberal like ideology is basically twisting that around into, um, yeah, commodification. And when you bring race into that issue as well, it really muddles things up. Right, and I think that's an important point though. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'll just go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, there was a movement in the 90s for charter charterization, but it had nothing to do with necessarily privatization, right? Like, I remember being in, in favor of, of charters at a certain point, and like, I remember my parents were talking about it, um, but that's where the innovation was. Like, it's sort of a, a laboratory where you're like, figure it out, then bring it back to the public system so that we can do the most good for most people. Um, it's, it's lost that, that aspect of it. I completely agree. There, there's a part, agree, there's a part of the charter school movement in which like, oh, this is legit. We can make these schools super radical and critical and, you know, do stuff against the district. Um, but obviously that's not what we're seeing, you know, like when you're talking about neoliberalism, I was like, that's exactly the biggest issues with education I'm seeing in Stockton, in which there's so much identity politics, people talking about representation and thinking that's all we need to do, you know, and it's, it's very much infiltrated in our district. Um, not all, of course, but for the most part, many of the Teach for America folks I've known um, all fall into that. And it's extremely exploitive of the students of these poor communities. Um, they go there, they take their photos, and they talk about, yeah, look what I did for these youth, and they're all poster kids. Um, it's, it's really crazy in our district, for example, um, well, we he just uh, well we just got rid of him, but we took up. I'm I'm assuming you all are familiar with John Daisy. He was mm -hmm. LAUSD superintendent. Um, he was ours for a couple of years. He just um, got booted out. But it was a lot of the same things. He was doing some crazy things. 
he uh, messed with the funding so much. He got so many TFA folks to work for the district and he was pushing out all these charter, these different charter schools that were, some were piloted by the district, some were just depend, uh, independent of the district, but it definitely, it's, it's a big deal. And they really, really take advantage of the students and use them for the most part, especially some like local folks who are involved in various forms of politics and things like that. Yeah, there, there's some fucking gangsters in there. It's disgusting. Yeah, and it doesn't really help that, you know, during that time, there was this whole trend of voluntourism that was involved. That just makes the deal that much more irresistible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like those white folks taking pictures in Africa, the Peace Corps, you know, it's kind of like the same mentality. It's just, it's in the United <laughs> States. There's like high poverty here too. Most people are very uh, disillusioned and not aware that racism still exists or, you know, poverty exists. I'd like to think they're becoming more aware now with this whole COVID-19, but then again, we've also got MAGA people storming the Michigan Capitol with automatic weapons, so I'm not going to hold my breath. Yeah, we've been seeing that a lot in Huntington Beach and Orange County and San Diego. I mean, luckily, oh, yeah. they're, luckily they're not carrying guns, hopefully, at least not yet, but you know, they're still storming around, and yeah, it's just crazy. Nah, out here in the Midwest, everyone's got mm-hmm. a gun. Oh, geez. That's right. Have you all um, seen some of the, I don't know how thorough the research is, but Asian American folks starting to buy up more guns because of everything that's going on with the discrimination and with the coronavirus? Yeah, I I heard about that. I mean, there's been like hundreds of cases being reported every day. Um, I know there's a website. I forget exactly what it was, but there's been a lot of reports ever since um, this shelter in place. Yeah, I think it's Stop AAPI Hate is one of the websites that have been okay, recording cool. it. Um, it. One of my former professors, Russell Jung, um, at SF State, he's one of the folks looking over the website. I sat in on a presentation, and he was talking a whole lot about, you know, it's a terrible time, of course, but he's even more worried about when we finally return to schools and what that's going to look like for students and mm-hmm. how they're going to be treated. And I was like, wow, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, that was the next question that was on the list. How do you think this COVID-19 pandemic or afterwards, you know, when we go back is going to affect the Asian students and also Asian teachers, just Asians in general? It's funny because I've been reflecting on that. And and I feel like we've touched on a lot of these issues um, today. But um, one of my friends, he is a host for, I'm not sure what program, on KPFA. um, But he's very radical, very progressive person who's involved in a lot of community activism. But he asked me and some other people to join this uh, Facebook group um, that's called something, I can share this later, Stop Asian Violence or something. And he asked me to join not because he wants me to be informed or to contribute. Uh, The group was getting a lot of people who were joining. But uh, the moderator, and I think there's only one, he shares some extremely um, anti-Black, um, like Asian versus other people of color, uh, media and messages. So it's like stuff talking about Asian American discrimination, and then he'll jump something else on something else and say, like, why are Black people doing this? It's, so, it's like it's really um, terrible, crazy stuff that I can also link to you all later. Sounds like that's exactly what 45 wants or the rich corporations. That's exactly what they want right now. It kind of sounds like the Koreatown riots. I don't know if you guys uh, know about it you know, in the 90s. When, when you said buying weapons, that's exactly what went through my head. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of uh, Korean and uh, black tensions and like a lot of people framed it as a Korean black, like anti-Korean or anti-black um, issue. I mean, it was larger than that, of course, you know, with, but yeah, it's just the, the way it gets framed is we just get pitted against uh, other people of color. I always, um, I feel like when I go back to teaching, one thing I really like to touch up on in my class is the Black Panther movement. But I also really like to bring up the fact that in Chicago, the Black Panthers allied themselves with young patriots who were like poor working class white ex-KKK members. And the reason why they allied themselves 
was because they knew exactly what it felt like to be crushed by the rich. And, you know, going back to what everyone already said, how, like, the young patriot said, look, at this point, racism is the rich man's tool. They want to pit us poor white folks against poor black folks. And we're fighting for scraps while they enjoy the rest. So, like, going back to your question about, like, what do I think is going to happen? I'm going to try and prepare for that. But, you know, that's definitely something that needs to be discussed. Yeah, I I definitely agree with that. I think it's hard to say what's going to happen to an entire group of so many diverse people that are Asians. Um, And I would assume that it depends on the kind of community that they're going into when we go back to school. But um, I I do think that there's going to be a lot of um, pent up anxiety around race that's not articulated. Um, I think that people are going to want to figure out who they are post this pandemic, um, whether it's racial or cultural or political. So the way that I want to kind of prepare for it is to figure out more interesting ways to get students to know each other as people, um, help build their identity and like figure out if they can just kind of think for themselves because I feel like my time now, when I look, when I think back on the time where I had a classroom, like I could actually go to this classroom and like try to teach people and I loved it. And it was, it was such an effective form of organization. And now I sort of think of this, that time is, is so precious. So yeah, trying to figure out how my own identity aligns with all that is gonna be how I prepare. Carlos, I know you're listening in, but I don't know if you wanted to add anything or ask, ask us anything. Yeah, I'm, I'm mostly just listening. You know, all right, cool. Yeah. Are you all, um, out of curiosity, familiar with any um, Asian American male teacher communities or anything like that that um, shares these kinds of resources or has these discussions? I was just curious. Um, we could just start one right now. <laughs> I feel like we've been just, this is probably just the beginning of it because I've never seen one. I Believe me, I Googled it and searched it. I don't find anything. You know what? It's interesting you mentioned that, Aldrich, because... I've been in a lot of uh, male men of color spaces and usually I tend to be like the only Asian male. Like that's something I noticed because I've been to like Latino male like groups, right? Uh, or it's not really necessarily Latino. It's not focused on the Latino identity, but it just happens to be mostly like, you know, Latino males there. But I just happen to be one of the few Asians. Um, but yeah, we there is no like Asian male spaces in general, I feel like. Although there might be some in like businesses or like medical or like lawyers, like in different fields. But in terms of education I, or like even just discussing um, these kind of topics, I, I haven't really encountered one. Takashi, you, you were saying, saying earlier, and I, you said you looked at the data, are there way more Asian American female teachers than male teachers? Um, I don't know. I, I was just looking at the female teachers in general, but just based on that assumption, I, I would just assume that there were more Asian American female teachers just because, uh, you know, like elementary school teachers tend to be more females in general. And just from what I've observed, there are more uh, female, you know, Asian American women teachers in elementary school. And that's where it happens to be most. Yeah, Aldrich, when we were over at um, UCLA, I remember very early on, somebody, one of the professors gave the statistic. They said that we make up 2% of the teaching force elementary through high school and that Asian males make up less than 1% of that. So whatever, I don't know what that stat is, but kind of gives you a sense of how tiny of a a spot we make up. We're definitely Um, a a very minority group, huh? Right. I mean, you all touched on this already, but there's very little Asian teachers to begin with in the United States. And, you know, very few Asian male teachers. Probably that's also the reason why there are no Asian male spaces for educators, just because the numbers are so small. Mm. I mean, there are like few social justice educator groups, like the ones I mentioned, like people's ed movement. Um, I know like association of Rasa educators, but that tends to be more focused on Rasa identity. Um, I know there's a few for like black educators, but yeah, I'm not sure about, yeah, I haven't really encountered even any Asian specific educators, right? That's at least like focus on like urban schools or inner city or like focusing on social justice issues. 
Well, I actually invited two of my other friends um, as, a, as, a, as future guests, and I told them about what we're doing today. And I said, you know, there's already too many people. Um, and they're, they both were very interested, and they're not normally, like, interested in things that I have to tell them. So to, for them to say, hey, that's kind of interesting, I was like, oh, okay, well, how about that? And so I think that there's definitely a, a desire and a curiosity for, like, an Asian space to talk about education and not only that, but to, to sort of look at it through this lens of, of justice for people, like working poor people, um, people who suffer, that's, that's a very unique, it's kind of interesting just to think about and to, if that kind of space existed for me where I felt like safe and to go there and like share my ideas, I would definitely go there. But um, yeah, it just hasn't been on the radar in any sense. I mean, this could be a space, I guess. This could just be a start of it, you know? You gotta start somewhere. Yeah. And make you know, this career sustainable feature Asian Americans got to start somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause I, I mentioned this earlier, part, part of the reason why I wanted to do this episode on the pod was cause I couldn't find any information about it on in the internet mm. and it would just be, you know, good for us to talk about it too. And this podcast, um, just to give you guys context, like for Aldrich and Nathaniel, um, Daniel, Carlos and I uh, started it, like I believe in April. I know we've been talking about it and it's just, uh, we're kind of focusing on education issues like race and culture, like the past episodes, um, you know, you guys kind of looked through it. Like we, like the last episode we focused on like the com complexity of Latin American identity. We talked about like, what does it mean to be a good teacher or good student, uh, education reform. So just variety of different topics. Hmm. But um, well, yeah, we would love to have you uh, guys on um, for the future pod too. And I think if, if we wanted to, we can also do this maybe like monthly or biweekly or something where it's for spaces for Asian male educators, right? I mean, I'm down to do that because that's something we need and so something that's lacking right now. Yeah, I mean, when I, yeah, definitely. Like when I looked at your face, Nathaniel, I already know Aldrich, right? And so when I saw you, I was like, I, it's kind of like two dogs that are walking on the road and they, I know they each other based on their species. Like I know you you think and so in, you know like i want to know more about you that's how i felt and if there's more of us yeah. that, that'd be fantastic I'm kidding. <laughs> thank you yeah yeah it'd be really cool it'd be really cool to continue the conversation like just being just for today being on in this on this podcast and in this space i was like wow i haven't thought about that in a long time you know and Maybe it's because I haven't had a space or folks to have those conversations with. Um, so having the space definitely is very helpful in my own reflection. Yeah. I mean, that's all I got. <laughs> I don't know if you guys got anything else. Um, <laughs> and also, we don't always have to record it uh, every time. If, if you guys feel more comfortable not recording it, just to have like a space for dialogue, like I also understand too. I don't even know who listens to this podcast anyway, but you know, <laughs> like whoever's listening, like, They'll get a lot out of it. So if you're not listening, you know, you're missing out. Some will listen, some will care. Do you all have a, like Instagram or Facebook groups for this podcast too to help advertise it? Uh, good point. I haven't been with, I'm not really good at advertising it. I'm going to probably just start. Um, all I have is a SoundCloud and like it's probably going to expire in a couple of days. So I got to, <laughs> you know, um, try to get it back on. And it's also on Spotify and uh, Google Podcast and Anchor. But yeah, I think that's a good idea, like creating a social media account, like a Facebook or Instagram. I'm not really good at Instagram, but Facebook, I, I'm always on it. Um, you guys see my posts. So. You are always on. I, I read so many of your articles, Takashi. Yeah. I'm not very good with social media. I feel, I feel outdated in many, many ways. I was just on Instagram the other day and I was like, what are all these messages? And there are like 25 of them. Yeah. And I guess I didn't know how to manage all that. They're probably asking you for naked pictures or something. There was none of that. <laughs> I, was, I was disappointed. Very lonely in these times. I, I was just kind of curious. Uh, are you guys uh, also involved with other organizations or groups? I mean, it doesn't have to be similar to this, but just in general, like outside of school. Some of the, uh, one of my friends who just moved, moved back home from Oakland, he uh, helped start the People's Ed Oakland chapter. Mm. So we've discussed doing the Central Valley or San Joaquin County or Stockton kind. 
Um, I do work with Little Manila Rising, a local organization. Their, their history has been about historical preservation um, locally, but uh, through them we've started our after school programs. But otherwise, you know, it's, it's for me to have these discussions, it's folks I hear about from like my undergrad or grad school days who check in with me, but definitely no local physical space locally. Yeah, same. Um, just work the, the schoolhouse. And I mean, there is this other cat in the Bay Area. His name is Jonathan Luong. And he, we were the first, we started talking about like, it'd be nice to just have Asian dudes, Asian people to talk about education. So I meet with him like once a week. We talk about these issues. We think about ideas for publications, but that's about it. And then there's this enterprise, Takashi, of course, that, you know, it, it does bring my mind to this space where I have to do research and think about things and try to be thoughtful. Um, you want to invite him to the next part or, uh, you know, for this group, uh, when we have this uh, Asian male educator group, like, yeah, feel free to do so. That'd be pretty cool. I know that for me, I haven't been as involved as I used to be. I don't know if it's just because I'm getting, I'm getting older, or, but um, I've been, I'm still part of the, like going to like the trainings on the transformative justice circles uh, with the Youth Justice Coalition. Cause I used to teach there at that school and I'm still connected with the people there and they do really amazing workshops on training on, you know, transformative justice, which is very, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know how to put it. Instead of like, putting people into prisons or like thinking different ways of accountability, right. Instead of um, disciplining and punishing and kind of similar to the restorative justice, but it's a lot different because it's more community oriented. It's not just like housed in uh, a school structure. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I gain a lot of knowledge from there and it's just good to have conversations with folks from that group too. I live under a rock outside of school so i'm not really involved <laughs> with much outside of it I, I do help out with after school but aside from that not much no yeah i mean life of a teacher is sometimes you're limited on time so <laughs> i understand and what and once you have time you're like i just want to check out and yeah out and right, exactly i want to forget about else. time yeah I mean, exactly yeah i mean that'd be a cool thing to talk about in the future like ways of maintaining as an asian american male teacher Mm -hmm. during the coronavirus era like there's a lot <laughs> here going on mm -hmm. yeah yeah going into the therapy too like because i also like as i mentioned i have a background in counseling and i technically have a degree in therapy i just need to get a license if i wanted to focus on that but that one that field is even more scarce on males like, if you think teachers have less males, like therapists, counselors have way less males. And if you want to get specific, Asian males are like are unicorns. Like, you'll never see an Asian male therapist. And it, it also kind of wants me to push towards that field just because of the lack of, uh, you know, men of color and Asian males in general in that field. You want to see some unicorns. <laughs> yeah. Me too. Yeah. When I, I, I've gone through to see ter therapists through Kaiser, which is why I went for insurance. Damn, they're terrible. And one time I asked, they always pair me up with a white woman. And I asked, hey, I was curious, um, are there any men of color? You know, I, I just said that because I felt like there were many or I wouldn't find an Asian American male color, uh, Asian American therapist, male therapist. And she was like really taken back. Like, she, like I offended her. I was like, damn. She was like, well, you know, I can look. And she never got back to me. Um, and she was like, yeah, but, you know, just, just so you know, I, I'm very used to, like, different colored people. And I was like, yep, that's why I need a new therapist after <laughs> yeah. that statement. <laughs> oh, my God. I was like, oh. forget that <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah, so I've, I've heard there are apps like BetterHelp where you could possibly be directed towards someone more specific. So I'm hoping we'll look into that. I was kind of curious about this. Um... I think Daniel and Aldrich, you guys might know about this. And Daniel, I'm not sure if you know about it. Um, in Oakland, there's a charter school called Roses That Grow From The Concrete, right? That was started by Jeff Duncan and Andrade. I, uh -huh. I was just kind of curious if you guys knew anything about it. Because I know, like, there, we have, like, people have criticism about charter school. But is that, like, considered one of, like, the better charter schools? Or, you know, is mm -hmm. there? I, I don't know. I'm just, because <laughs> I don't know anything about it except what I see on the website. 
I don't know. Did I? Well, from what I've been hearing, <laughs> not really. Mm. <laughs> Dang, people find out they're gonna be haters, but whatever. Um, yeah, I think I think that notion because I was a student of Jeff Duncan Andrade. He was the one. He was um he pushed me to go to to TEP uh, at UCLA, and um, you know I. I kind of was taken back when I saw some of their advertisements and it was like, there was one thing I read. It was like, they were hyping up how, yes, our teachers work like 90 hours plus a week. And I was like, uh, that's not something you should be hyping up. So you're exploiting their labor. Um, so there was stuff like that I've heard. And I think, I think the idea is, and I think it's very neoliberal. They come off, a lot of these charter schools are like that. They come off as very progressive, very student based, and they could be, but um, they're not managing a school correctly. They're using the kids as poster kids. Um, oftentimes they're pushing out the kids who aren't doing academically well, which I've seen at charter schools I worked at. So um, that's just, you know, me, what I've heard. Are, I've heard people who left that campus because of a lot of those situations in which people and educators and uh, even counselors, I think, weren't getting the respect they deserved. Yeah, I've heard that it's, um a place where the sophists go to breed more of their double think. They, I think Jeff Duncan Andrade, and you mentioned this Aldrich, like you're not, there are certain things that it does not do to say. And I think that when that comment is paired with the idea that the school is named roses that grow out of concrete, um, it's almost like the, the fist is going into my anus in some sense. And I think that that is sort of a, a reaction out of that left, that kind of thinking that is actually not left and it's not progressive, it's not critical, but it does this weird double think. And they're holding two opposing fundamental ideas at the same time. And they're flourishing their artistry around this notion, which is self-contradictory. And so you're going to get a mess and it's going to be a fucking circus and a Frankenstein. And sure, there's going to be a couple of, you know, kids of color that pass through and they go to Yale and then you can, you know, send them up. But um, it reminds me of this fellowship I did at Stanford, which is your first mistake. But I went there and what they did is they, they brought this kid who was from Guatemala and um, he had, you know, made it through the barrios, they said, right? That was the actual narrative. And then he made it to Stanford. He came to our wonderful institution, this young man, you know, and then he went to Wall Street and worked for um, JP Morgan. And now he's coming back to show you the way. And that narrative, and I, this is a, a, a room full of educators who work with, you know, poor kids. That was like the whole shtick, right? But the entire room stood in applause. People working for charter schools, public schools, Title I schools, they all stood up in applause and rallied together these these lefties and congratulated the the histrionics of this, this tale so i think that at school roses of concrete is kind of like that it lives in the shadows of oakland because nobody needs to look at the numbers because if you look at the numbers and what happens it's not going to look pretty but you keep the name running and the narratives and jeff duncan andrade and his his groupies and all that People yeah. love that rhetoric. They'll just eat oh, it yeah. and not question it. And it's so problematic. And Sexy. it freaks me out. Like, really? Just just from that, that little video clip, it's all good? Like, you're not going to look any deeper or think about it more? Like, it really bothers me when people do that. Right. Uh, same. And I, and I don't want me to take up too much um, space here, but I just want to comment on that last comment, Aldrich, which is, I think it's also very sincere. I don't think that they're intentionally doing anything bad, but it, it reminds me of in the 60s, people were willing to go for MLK when he talked about race. But when you start talking about po like serious poverty and what that does, there's a stop. There's this divide that happens. And I think that's where Andrade sort of leaves off. I'm very curious actually to hear what you guys and what other teachers, especially out there, think of uh, uh, Andrade because like over here, at the University of Chicago, like he's quite well known. And I mean, his stories are inspiring. So when everyone was talking about like, uh, you know, the school and his groupies, I'm very curious now to hear what you think. 
Yeah, kind of similar to what you just said, Nathaniel. When I first heard him speak, because I've seen him in person, um, this was back in undergrad, I was really inspired by his speech and just captivated and, you know, kind of pushed me towards education, kind of like what you said, Aldrich. And, you know, he's connected with Wayne Yang, one of my mentor and someone I look up to. And, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. You actually look at his videos and like the places that he does presentation, it tends to be in an area where it's kind of more wealthy or like high class, you know, like the audiences tend to be like white or like just bougie. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just that the audience seems to be captivated, as you said, by his speech. And yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of wondering you know, if, if that was like an intentional thing just to get like money from like donors or uh, people that are watching, you know, his stuff. And I've had a friend who, who's also a, an amazing educator. I, I would like to get him on in the future pod who mentioned that he saw, he went to one of his workshop, uh, Andrade's, and I think he, he was like replaying like a traumatic narrative of one of his students and it was involving like a rape incident, very traumatic. And he just played it. And as soon as it was over, he did his presentation and just left. And there was no time for question, no time for reflection. And everybody in that room was just like, what the fuck did that just happen? He just used his students narrative. And it was like a very vulnerable, traumatic incident as a part of his workshop, you know? Um, and mm. just based on that, I, I don't know. I, I think my thoughts on him has changed, uh, just, just because of, you know, part of just build, building onto that kind of incident. So. It, for me, it's definitely changed. And one of the things for him and a lot of folks in, in those same spaces, um, like one thing that I eventually became aware of was the hyper masculine, um, Hmm. that was coming out you know um that was a big big deal but um you know when i was a student at sf state as an undergrad student like yeah i love this dude i was like dude this is it and i, I don't know if it's because he represented this like taking back of being a poor person of color growing up from the hood whatever it, it maybe it was that but um definitely like i loved his rhetoric i loved his classes and then you, when I start, started to understand education, because uh, he would always hype up the group of students he taught in East Oakland, which I thought was cool. Like, damn, you're a high school teacher and you're a professor. And then I started looking into it more deeply. And he had like several people there teaching, which is not indicative of the actual reality of teachers in inner schools or poor urban suburban communities, you know? Um, so a lot of those things eventually started coming out and I was thinking, huh. And then I started looking more deeply. I realized, oh, he used to be part of, he was a TFA person. So TFA like holds this person up real high. So definitely like my views are, are definitely changed on him and the Roses and Concrete School. Um, I don't hate how the, the path that led me on to as far as being like a critical educator. Um, sure. I really appreciate those moments, but definitely like, I, I am more critical of him and folks who have that rhetoric, and, you know, and we should have no idols. And I felt like for that quick moment of time during undergrad, I idolized this dude. I was like, dude, this is it. This is what we need to do. So definitely changed. Wow. And he was at, he was at, uh, he was at UCLA for a while, right? He was big mm -hmm. at UCLA when we were there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I think Aldrich basically covered the whole thing, the whole gamut. I think it, it does go back to the idea of idolatry though, uh, especially in education. Because we are a, a quote unquote profession in which the number of times that I've heard, oh, I'm going to steal that. And then they flaunt stealing material from other people. That's not, that's not how you, if, if that's the way this profession is supposed to be, um, it's, it's quite disappointing. Um, so if you have that as a context and you have these idols that are raised and you have folks who are not, at least in, in the general sense, not critically minded, and you have false idols or idols at all, you, there's a, just a confusion. And in the midst of that, all these kids are kind of looking at you like, what are you doing? <laughs> we could do this ourselves if you just give us the money and the things. No, that's actually a very good point. The whole idea of idols, I mean, because I, 
I would feel that, especially in teaching, the first people who drop out of this profession are the super optimistic, the people who do get their hopes up, place it in one or two individuals, and then boom, the whole thing shatters later on. So no, I would definitely agree with that. Well, that's just one more person to add to the list then. <laughs> you can join Martin Luther King, Gandhi, that sort of thing. All right. Sherman Alexi. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> it's a matter of time. Yeah. <laughs> Winter is coming. Speaking of idols, that last season. <sighs> idols toppling over. The yeah. whole franchise just. Yeah. <laughs> I was so pissed. Like, seriously, that, wow. Ruined the whole thing. Right, right. It reignited my loyalty to Lord of the Rings, though. I will say that. Uh, uh, that's very nice. That's very, very nice. Well, I have a question for you all. Like, speaking of, like, neoliberalism and, and identity politics, I finally, I, I, uh, I decided to follow a list and watch all the Star Wars movies and animated series in order. And it was wow. cool, you know, and I finally got to this Rise of Skywalker thing. And there's a big part of me that's like, fuck Disney, evil fucking company. Then I was like, damn, this is sick. Look at all the people of color in this movie. Look at the Asian Americans. <laughs> this is a shit. Like, you know, it's hard. It's really hard to figure out how I feel about that. I want to enjoy it, but also be critical of it. But I'm like, this is fucking cool. That's right. So it's, weird. it's Disney playing with your heartstrings, you know, from the offices in the dark corners. Yeah. We got Aldrich. Good. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, I always remember, like, when you brought up Disney and people of color, I always think about um, back when Family Guy was actually decent. Do you remember when, uh, like, Peter frees all the uh, minority kids from the you know, it's a small, small world show and like they go running free and then the security guard's like, hey, you can't do that. Those children are the property of the Disney Corporation type of thing. There it is. Good look for that. Wow. Um, I too tried to do the Star Wars thing, Aldrich. And I, I gave up steam at a certain point. But my cousins told me not to even watch The Rise of Skywalker. They said, just don't waste your eyes. They said, these are like Star Wars freaks. They're like, just don't do it. It'll ruin you. So I really haven't. I haven't touched it. But now I want to because it's, you know, you're not supposed to touch it. Now it's like, I'm going to get high and watch it. Yeah. Let's <laughs> <laughs> we'll see who's What's that again, Nathaniel? I said, I'm in the exact same boat, except. I have been perfectly happy with just ending things at Rogue One. Like after I saw Rogue One, I thought, you know what? I have the entire story down now up until, you know, what was it? Um, the Force Awakens. Right. I can just leave it at that. I have that glorious vision of Darth Vader murdering rebel scum. I'm content. That must be a nice reality. Ignorance is bliss sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. And then you have Lord of the Rings to, to really give you the, the foundation. Yeah. Although I will say I didn't go into the Hobbit movies at all. That I will say uh, I'll just be content with the book. Right, right. Have you all um, watched any episodes of the new PBS docuseries on Asian Americans? <laughs> I saw like the first 30 minutes of the first episode. I've been meaning to get back on it, but I was surprised by what they were covering. Like, I know they were covering like the Igorot people in the Philippines. And, oh, I didn't see that episode. Huh. Yeah, and then they were covering like certain Asian ethnic groups that you wouldn't think would be covered. I just assumed it was going to be like, oh, the general like Koreans mm -hmm. and Japanese American internment and Chinese exclusion. But no, they, they actually went deep into some of the episodes. Like they mentioned like the Hmong people too, which I was really surprised. Mm -hmm. at. Really? I need to check that out though. But I haven't seen everything yet, but uh I'll be Yeah. I um there's some some cool folks I met through that uh who well I got asked to do some lesson plans for some of the episodes. Sorry, one lesson plan. Like I act like I did a whole bunch of curriculum for them. 
<laughs> but I did, I did a lesson plan. And um, it was cool. I got to meet these educators from across the country. And um, it was really interesting. There are a lot of just watching folks talk about the, the doc series in itself and how people wanted certain areas to get more political and go deeper. And it was very much like representative of this whole identity politics, neo neoliberalism. And like PBS would stop at certain points and not go too deep. But mm -hmm. the, the episode I really worked on for my lesson plan was it covered the 1960s. So, so the third world liberation front, United farm workers, the, um, anti-war movements against the Vietnam War um, and also the arts that were taking place in that time. So it was really cool. I haven't seen the other ones, but I was just curious what you all thought about that. I'm definitely going to check it out. I think it's free right now on PBS oh, really? online, online yeah, for, now, for a little while. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm sure you'll be able to find it online afterwards too. People are going to find a way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, we will. Um, I have to get going. So I want to say my goodbyes as if I'm dying. Um, Carlos, I didn't get to <laughs> hear your voice, but I would like to hear your voice at some point before I you depart. Can hear oh, okay. Well, here it is. I don't know. Are you doing okay? Yes, I'm, I'm safe. Everything's, everything's good. Yeah. How, how are things, uh, how are you doing over there in the Bay? Uh, the same semi-depressed, but, you know, oh. enjoying the amazing fact that I don't have to worry about a lot of things except for my solitude. Um, Aldrich, so good to see you. My goodness, I can't believe it's already been 40 years since we saw each other. Yeah, oh, it's been a long time. I, I yeah. haven't, haven't checked in since all that dumbass drama went, went down with your school. So yeah. it's really good to hear from you. And you've talked to meeting Nathaniel and Carlos really cool. But um, when this is all over, it'd be great. Well, you're pretty local. Daniel, right here. Oakland, so Oakland. So we could probably meet up for a coffee or dinner or lunch or something. Since you're, Absolutely. You're my, uh, a good friend of mine, a childhood friend of mine lives out in Stockton. He's a teacher. Oh, cool. Yeah. You know what school? He's at College Ready Academy in downtown Stockton. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a charter school. Stockton. It is a Do you know school. what teacher? Yeah. Say it again. What's his name? His name is Liam Hinn. You can talk him after this. He, okay, okay, okay. Cool, uh, cool. He teaches Latin and theory, uh, Latin and like theories of knowledge for the IB program. Oh, okay, okay. Theories cool, 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 cool. Nice, nice. Okay, cool. Yeah, he's one of the cats I told you about. I would like to invite him here, see what kind of crazy things he would have to say. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Nathaniel, oh. very, very nice to meet you. Yeah, very cool to meet you too. Stay safe out there in Chicago. Thank you. Will do. Yeah, thanks for the invite, everyone. It was really good. I really appreciated this yeah, time. It was rad. Yeah. yeah, we'll do this again. Like, just maybe like bi weekly or I, I don't know what yeah. works for you guys. Saturday at three Pacific time, because I know, Nathaniel, you're, you're coming from a different time zone. I, I just realized that too <laughs> when I was trying to make it. But yeah, Saturday is at three. Um, we we'll definitely, that's what we, when we do our pods. Cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. All right, you guys. All right, you guys have everyone. to go. Um, you guys can go. I'm just going to be on it for a bit longer. But um, yeah, thank you guys for coming in on. Thanks. It was really nice being y'all. Take care. Stay safe. Yeah.